As you've uh, no doubt noticed, the primary drawback to using an Amiga like this was the uh, floppy disk access times. Uh, certainly not the greatest uh, way to compute, especially with a single floppy drive. So hard drive prices being what they were in the 80s, most people would uh, instead opt to purchase a second floppy drive. And I have one here, and I'll connect it up and show you just how uh, easy it would be to add another floppy or any other hardware uh, to the Amiga. Uh, turn the computer off, and then take your floppy drive. This one here is a third-party floppy drive. I'm just going to kind of put it here along the side. And with the cable, plug it into the disk drive port on the back, which is back here, and plug it in there. And then turn the computer back on. And it will automatically recognize that there are two disks now available. Okay, we're booted into the uh, workbench here, and now I'm going to slide my DigiPaint 3 disk into the second drive and you'll see that it automatically detects that there's a disk in there and the icon shows up on the desktop. So let's go ahead and open up DigiPaint 3. And again, you got two floppies, so you don't have to do much disk swapping. It'll automatically read whichever disk it needs. And the cool thing about it is you could put them into either drive. You could swap these disks around and the Amiga would, uh, it wouldn't care. It would just say, you know, if it needed a disk a file from a disk would just say stick it in any drive and uh, as long as you did that uh, you were good to go. Okay, now here you can see a use of the multiple screens. The menu is actually in a screen with its own resolution. You can see the mouse pointer slipping behind the screens here. We can bring them front to back by doing this. But let's go ahead and open up a, a picture here. We're going to load from the uh, paint bench uh, disk. Alright, and uh, we need to find the images folder, just a single click on the folders, and let's open up Fashion. We'll open the file. It'll ask us if we want to load the palette from the file, which we want to do. And here comes a nice speedy disk load. But you can see the uh, graphics capabilities of the computer were actually very impressive, considering that this was the time of the black and white Macintosh and CGA graphics for uh, PCs, which was only you know, just a handful of colors. So to see a display like this with, with such a vivid and uh, realistic color and display, it looks just about like a photograph. As I get in really close, you can see it is not extremely high resolution but the number of colors uh, make up for it and it looks just uh, amazing uh, when you compare it to other computer displays at the time and the Amiga accomplished this with a trick called hold and modify if I bring up the uh, program uh, toolbar here you can see we have a palette across here which is a 16 color palette which is fairly standard for computers at the time uh, the Commodore 64 and 128 both had a 16 color palette, of course that was 16 fixed colors. Uh, in the Amiga these 16 colors could be any of the 4096 total available colors. I'm going to go ahead and pick a black here and I'm going to clear this image and uh, demonstrate how hold and modify mode works. Okay, if we paint from any of the colors in our 16 color palette then it will behave as a standard paint program would. We'll draw some white on here, <clears throat> and then uh, get some of this reddish color. Okay, that's all standard, nothing unusual there. If we pick the palette tool, though, now we can pick from any of our 4096 colors, uh, stuff that is not in our 16 color palette here. So let's uh, take a green here. Let's go to uh, this green color now. When I start drawing this green down here, you'll notice some interesting things start to happen. See those horizontal lines starting to appear? Like there's some obvious yellow there, and even a darker green before we get into the actual uh, green color I'm painting. Obviously a dark, dark color there. Now when I release the mouse button, it'll try to clean it up a little bit. It'll probably do a pretty good job, but you see there's still an obvious transition right there of a color that I didn't paint with. And the same thing here, we've got a yellow line that's uh, bordering, and then a darker green actually on the other side of the two. Let's uh, pick another color. Let's go with a uh, purple. 
I'll we'll paint this purple down. You can see similar things happening here. So I draw down through. And you can see there's a definite transition in the uh, colors there. How about this uh, yellow color? That's not in our 16 color palette. Let's paint across with that. Look at the craziness happening there. I'll release the mouse button, it'll clean it up quite a lot. But you can see there's definitely some transitions uh, bordering our colors that are not in our 16 color palette. And that is the uh, effect of the hold and modify. So let's take a look at that right there. Hold and modify works by taking the pixel on the left, holding two of the RGB values for that pixel, and then modifying the third value. Of course, as you probably know, uh, these computer screens are made up of red, green, and blue phosphor cells and uh, different intensities of the red, green, and blue create all of the different colors. You can see the red lines obviously there and then all the red, green, and blue lit up together make the white. It's a subtractive color system. So let's go down and take a close look right here where we have a transition happening. You can see we've got the purple which is a primarily a red and a blue pixel. And in the first of the transitions there it is modifying the red pixel, turning it off, but leaving the blue lit and then in the next pixel it turns the blue off and that makes that dark line there and then finally it modifies the green and we get the green color we need so the effect is it can take up to three pixels to transition from one color to the other if those colors are not in our 16 color palette so it's a little hard to see from that angle but we actually have a more, a more of a blue color as we leave the purple when the red pixel gets turned off then we have a very dark color as both the red and the blue are turned off and then finally the green as the green is turned on. So the ham fringing was an unwanted side effect of the trickery used to get 4096 colors on the screen at once but it actually worked pretty well for digitized images because there's usually some anti-aliasing in those pictures anyway and uh, ham mode of course was kind of in some ways naturally anti-aliasing although sometimes the, the uh, transitions are not really as smooth as you would want. Okay, now we've got the uh, default Digi Paint palette here, and we're going to load that same image. This time when it asks to load the palette, we'll say don't do it. Now it's going to be forced to display using the standard 16 color palette that Digi Paint opens with. You can see here there's some fringing going on on the side there, and there's some particularly noticeable fringing happening down here where the uh, scarf uh, transitions into the background. So now let's reload this image. And this time, tell it to load the palette. This time we'll say yes, do it. The first thing you'll notice when I click OK is there'll be a lot of fringing going on as the base palette has changed. Lots of fringing happening here. And then as the image loads, that fringing will go away. And the whites of her eyes look better, the fringing here will be reduced. So using a base 16 colors that appeared prominently in your image would uh, help the uh, ham fringing be less noticeable and there's not very much noticeable ham fringing in this image. And uh, DigiPaint and DigiView were very good at uh, optimizing the palettes for the images. And I will demonstrate uh, DigiView in another video.